Baker. I'm multitasking with lots of children in my fake summer camp in, outside of the store. So I might not, unless I'm happy to do it, but if they're, I don't, I'm a little worried about my, whatever I'm doing. I'm, I'm fine with that unless somebody has an objection. What? For you to do it. I don't want to do it. Okay, well. <laughs> Okay, if I, if uh, I do it, I might have to step away. That's my own only. Okay, I, I, uh, I didn't quite get all that. I thought you were semi volunteering, so I, no. I can do it for today, I guess. Um, so, do we have anybody in the public arena? Uh, there is, I think, just one. Sally Burrell is on. Uh, with your permission, Kevin, I'll allow her to talk in case she has a public comment. Yes. All right, Sally, you have permission to talk if you have a public comment to make. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm just weighing in today. Uh, I haven't really been keeping up, but I'm aware that uh, there are, um, you know, the, the form that happened, the number of forms that happened back in 2018 um, were pretty uh, exciting. A lot of positive things were coming out and I just wanted to make sure that somehow we make sure that some of those great ideas and some of that energy and um, even some of those people maybe will have some sort of a chance to weigh in. I don't really know how that would work, but I'm, I'm thinking of um, in, in one area was about um, creating a new school building. Um, you know, something like that was uh, a big thing that was mentioned. And another thing was uh, putting a school community, uh, like a community center and school together. And we haven't really talked about that much with the scenarios, but I hate to see those just lost because I think there's um, something about them is really in enticing and exciting and involves all five communities all five towns and would be something that we could work together on and build together on and be excited about. Whereas um, there, you know, other parts of the scenarios are possibly divisive if, if elementary schools are getting dropped off or something like that. So I just want to just to bring that thought up as something to maybe reach back and um, have a discussion sometime about some of those ideas that were so fired up and exciting that people were on board with just because there was some of those ideas I hate to see them get lost but i don't know how that would work you know so i just wanted to say that just put it out there okay thank so, you yeah sure thanks for listening um the next the next act the next item is an action we've got a couple uh uh, minutes from meetings to approve. Would it's the pleasure of the group. Motion to approve. This is Josh. Second. Sarah. Okay. Any discussion? If not, let's uh, let's vote. If you're in favor, just say aye or raise your hand. I'm raising my hand. Okay. <laughs> any any opposed? Okay, carries. Um, do we have the next ish item? Is uh, if we've got any update from the NESDAQ study. I want to keep this on the agenda and uh, some days it may be a big topic and other days it might be nothing new. So um, uh, um, you usually will look to Patrick as he's coordinating with NESDAQ for any updates. And I do have an update and I'd say it fits between no news and big news. It's uh, <laughs> there's, there's some progress, but nothing major. Um, so I've been working with, with NESDEC around um, collecting information that they need to get launched for the, the demographic study, but as well as the just sort of the, 
the information specifically related to facilities as well. So each building principal, along with our facilities staff and Floyd have worked to complete a template for each school that provides a lot of different kinds of information about the number of classrooms, the size of classrooms, the use of classrooms, um, historical enrollment in terms of like what, what, their, what each school's enrollment was October 1 of last year. They're collecting information on our policy around class size, uh, that kind of information to inform their study. I've also worked with NESDEC to provide for them contact information for realtors and zoning folks in each town. And so they, they've likely already started reaching out to, um, to those folks to start their demographic study. And um, principals are working with NESDAC and, and we're including facilities as well to schedule the site visits, the virtual site visits of each school to happen between now and I think might it be July 15th specifically or, or sometime in that, that window of mid-July to have those virtual tours done. Um, and all of this is, is set up to be able to get them to a place where they can complete, a, it'll be a full draft of their report by August 1. They're, they'll have to update that report following October 1. So when we have our October 1 enrollment for the coming school year, they're going to want to update it to have more current information. In the event they can physically get into a building in the fall, um, they may still want to be able to do that as part of their update as well. But they'll at least have a draft report for us by August 1, which is far more timely and useful for conversations with the board, planning with the community, and even budget planning. Um, and it'll then be updated for that November window following the October one date. So a lot of the behind the scenes stuff is happening right now, but not a lot in terms of being able to report out. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? No. I guess I, I'm just I have a question about are they still working in sync with uh, Northwest or do you have any visibility to that? Yeah, so I have been, we've been part of a conversation with Addis Northwest um, since we last spoke, but I don't know that that included NESDEC. We talked some about the NESDEC study um, and um, Addison Northwest is still on the same timeline that we are. So they're providing the same information. We're, we're kind of working in parallel right now in terms of the information we're providing and the timeline in which we're providing that information and the date by which NESDEC is going to be um, providing the draft reports. And then also the same is true for their updated um, report in the fall. So definitely working with the same timeline and the same information. Thanks. Patrick, what was the original time frame like from our last meeting? Was that the original time frame was early to mid November before they had a, a draft for us. Um, and so because we we offered to get them the information they were looking for sooner and forego the in person visits and whatnot. Um, they're able to move their timeline up at least for a draft. Um, to a timeline that's much better. And so we, we can then have, albeit a draft, we can have a draft report that we can be looking at with the board at the retreat when we have some time dedicated to it. And we can be really thoughtful about what do we learn from that in terms of what, when, and how do we bring back before the community to keep the community you know, really closely in, uh, engaged in this work as it continues to evolve. So it's, again, although a draft, it's gonna give us something uh, much more useful um, at, a, at the right time. If it, if it didn't come until mid-November, that's a really tight timeline with everything that's going to be happening between mid-November and, and mid-January. So the only cost to it was just the in-person visits in some cases and and, and just need to weren't going to be realistic anyway. Right. 
Yeah, it's going to basically their draft is going to be based on dated information because it'll be based on last year's October 1 count um, and not having physically seen the buildings. If they get a chance to physically see and they get a new October 1 count, they'll update it. Um, but I don't think conceptually, I don't think, I don't think our October 1 count in this coming fall is going to uh, differ so dramatically from our past October 1 or from our, from our projections that we're going to be topping, talking about significant change from what the draft study is. It's going to be relatively minor in terms of the, the conceptual approach to how we respond to the information they provide. Are you worried about um, enrollment loss due to, I, I don't know, COVID, like in general, yes. like people pulling out? Okay, that's so in some ways be better to work with the old numbers. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm concerned about. I think um, in general, all of the concerns we had going forward are now exacerbated by complications from COVID. Yeah. Enrollment, uh, funding, which is tied to enrollment as well, but, but beyond that, um, it, it's, and, and honestly, it's going to tax our system. Like we're going to be asking our system to do more in particular as we try to somehow welcome students back and accommodate families that are not comfortable having their kids come back yet. Because I think, um, I don't think we're in a good position to say, no, we're only offering in-person instruction. And if you don't want that, you can home study your kids. I don't think we want to do that because families who can do that would, and we lose those students as enrolled students, which only further exacerbates our enrollment problem. I think even though it's going to be hard on our system, we have to figure out a way to accommodate the families that are not comfortable, at least out of the gate, um, with sending their kids back. There's probably going to come a point at which, you know, when there's a vaccine and, and things are kind of coming back to whatever the new normal is going to be, that we're going to have to say, all right, we, we can no longer sustain this and parents will have to make a choice. Um, but I don't think that's a choice that we want to force um, if we can avoid it. I'm a little confused. So when you talk about um, students not coming back to the classroom and loss of revenue because they're not being considered pupils, but if, so these, if these, so there won't be any sort of support outside of the, of the school, I guess that would, make it such that these students would still be part of the enrollment or the school's activities? Well, I think that's what I'm saying is that we, we need to be, even if we're saying that w our expectation is that all students are coming back physically present for uh, in-person learning, I think we need to be able to support families that are not ready for that in a remote or some sort of hybrid fashion, because I don't think we can, I don't think we could sustain what would be a, a significant loss in pupils because if if a student stays enrolled and we are supporting them remotely it's likely we're waiting for clarity on this but it's likely they would still count as an enrolled student that you know counts toward our equalized pupil number if a family chooses to home study enroll their child in a home study program we know they're unenrolled and they are no longer in our October count and that impacts our equalized pupil number. So my point is we want to work with families to help their kids be successful, even if they're not physically present when most kids are, um, at least for as long as we can. I, and I recognize that's going to be a big ask of our system. And additionally, should a child need to be quarantined for whatever reason, we want to be able to help them if they're able to access their learning from home and not unenroll, re-enroll, or in any way penalize them from a truancy standpoint because of the guidelines of needing to be quarantined. Yeah. And, and the reality is, despite our efforts to work with families to do whatever we can to help their, their children be successful and stay enrolled, there are going to be, I have no doubt, families that, um, that have the means and, and are going to exercise those means to keep their kids home and, and home study. And that, that's going to be real. 
I do think we're going to want to somehow, as we get closer and as we're starting to share more details about what the fall is going to look like, it's probably a wise thing to ask families, you know, say, this is what it's going to look like, given this, do you anticipate wanting to keep your child enrolled and, and work with the school district to provide some remote learning? Or do you anticipate uh, enrolling your child in a home study program in the fall? Those are going to be really, that's really important information for us to have as we try to kind of get zeroed in on the start of the school and what the expectations are going to be. I don't know how accurate the information will be, but um, to try and get the best information we can to start the school year, I think is going to be a wise, a wise approach. I only brought it up because even this, I hadn't overly thought it about it, but I was with somebody that I peripherally know in a neighboring district. And that person said, no, they're, they're just going to keep their four kids home and do their own homeschool thing this year. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> just for the year. Cause they just don't think it's going to get back to wherever in the year. And I thought, oh, that's, I hadn't really anticipated there would be that many of those. And well, so case in point, that one family with four kids staying home, that's $80,000 lost revenue. Yep, exactly. If it's about 20000 per kid. Now, obviously, so equalized pupils uh, built over a two-year average, so you don't feel that full effect in a single year. Uh, but as soon as it happened for a two-year period, you do feel that full effect. So There's a lot of conversations going on around the college communities, too, about taking a gap year. Yeah. Think of all that lost revenue. Oh, it's actually going to be pretty damaging for us around here. Yep. Okay, positive news. <laughs> hey, but good date. August 1st is a good start. That's, it's something in a window when we can do something with it. So we'll take it. Hey, if we, uh, any other comments regarding the study? The next agenda item is to start a discussion about collaborating potentially at some level with Addison Northwest, which is commonly known as Virgins. And um, I think Patrick, again, you have been involved in some discussions with that. Yeah, so I've been working pretty closely with their superintendent and kind of trying to line things up with the NESDEC study so that we are in a position to, you know, use the same kind of information in the same window of time to see if there are some opportunities there. And this is all born out of our fall conversations where there's some, ex some interest expressed in looking at con really continuing the partnership. We have uh, partnered with Addison Northwest in different ways for years now through collaboratives around sports and food service. Um, and, and I think that relationship that we've built over, over the past several years is part of what fed into the conversations this fall about possibly partnering um, even more so with Addis Northwest. And there's a whole host of different ideas about what that could look like. Anything from, you know, looking at our under enrolled classes at high school levels to see if there's a way to partner there to create some efficiencies while maintaining a, a breadth of offerings all the way up to a full on merger of the two districts, creating a new unified school district. So, and obviously there's a lot of possibilities in between in there, but we thought at least a starting place was let's collect the same kind of information and be in a position to have those kinds of conversations going forward. Taking that to a little bit of, a, of another level, um, in addition to working closely with their superintendent, um, Don and I have met a couple of times with, um, with their board chair and superintendent just talking about, just, again, just sort of um, thinking through procedurally, like who, when, and how do we need to kind of loop into this? Um, and what, um, what steps might there be? And in addition to that, Kevin, Krista, Don, and I have been meeting with Sue and talking about some possibilities there because what's interesting our, not only do we have this study that's happening, but the structures that exist for um, having these conversations and making some of these decisions and engaging the community parallel one another. So there's, so for example, they have a, a sort of facilities committee like this one 
that is an operation that maybe there's some potential relationship between this group and their group. They also have a community engagement group that maybe our community engagement committee can be talking more with. Obviously they have a school board and a lot of similar structures there. So um, trying to be somewhat intentional about not only collaborating at the end when we have this information, but thinking about what, what sort of mutual benefit might there be as we work through the process together leading up to various events that might come up in the fall. And I think that was part of the idea today was what, what might this group see as a benefit of working with say the Addison Northwest's version of the facilities team as we're contemplating um, the study and the information that comes about from the study, et cetera. So there, I, I guess the idea is there's, there's a lot of possibility for collaboration along the way um, from pretty much any point from this point forward. All I see is Mike's muted. Uh, Did um, Sue? Patrick. I'll go for it, Josh. Go ahead, here. Mm -hmm. oh, Okay. Um, my initial reaction is that's um, a really strong move, and I think it gives you more tools to work with in the long run. Um, there's always, not having thought through all the possibilities, I think, um, there's always the folks that live in Bristol who say, this is my school district and I don't know how it relates to anyone else. So there's that risk. Um, but I think opening, opening the, the, the gate as, uh, to, 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 um, so the two teams could at least look at each other and look at the different methods and uh, po possible collaborations. I think that's really smart. And I, I, I'm all for it. So. Sarah? Well, I forgot what I was going to say, so I'm going to have to think about it for another five seconds. How about how, how often does their, or actually I'm going to ask this question first. Did Sue have ideas so far? Uh, I'm trying to recall. I don't, I'm not remembering too many of the specifics, and I see Krista has joined as an attendee. So if uh, if you're interested, Kevin, we could see if she'd be willing to share because she was on that call too. I think my recollection from a big picture perspective is I think um, I think Sue felt there would be benefit in thinking about how the how the two organizations, both Addison Northwest, not not necessarily committees, but Addison Northwest and MAUSD, could partner given the similar structures going forward. But I don't think we talked in great detail about the ways in which they could, although we did, I think, talk a little bit about the potential for Sue to help facilitate some of that work. And, and I seem to recall there was some interest in that. And certainly, Kevin, uh, let me know if I'm making all of that up, but that seems to be what I recall. I, I think it's pretty accurate. And unless, certainly, unless anybody has an objection, we should have Krista come in because um, the next discussion item, she would be very, very, uh, very important to uh, kind of help along with that one too. So, okay, I'll, uh, I'll promote Krista to panelists so that she can participate fully then if that's right with you. Um, do you see a benefit to meeting before before or after the study? I think that's the question, right? So I think for me, and Kevin and I have spoken very briefly about this, but I think if this group could identify what might it want to get out of a relationship with the comparable Addis Northwest group, that might drive whether the, the two groups need to meet before or after the study or both. I think what you get out of it by meeting ahead of time is just a relationship and a easier way of communicating um and so even if it was just for the purpose of faces and names and you know what we're doing and what the process is and a short thing i think it would be helpful but that's um, 
I don't Sarah, you took my words. I, I, I agree completely. Um, I'll also, I'd like to understand the scope of what they're looking at. I mean, we're, we, I, I understand what we're looking at pretty well. And maybe having a discussion of what they're looking at would help sit, you know, help, you know, get the juices flowing in terms of the synergies that are possible. <clears throat> And what they've done for, you know, their community engagement and how, um, you know, what's been the energy or their, what, where I, it's, we hear things, but we don't really know, right? If we don't hear it from the source. So I think it would be a little more useful if we met with the sources. Anybody else? Patrick, did you have any concerns about opening the, the any, um, I mean, obviously it sounds like you're a proponent of this idea since you brought it to the table, but did you have any concerns that you may want to consider specifically? I don't have any real concerns, no. Um, obviously, just want to make sure we're clear in what we want to achieve so that we can be, you know, efficient with everyone's time and respect. But I, I think, yeah, I think the more that we're in the more we have opportunities to talk, I think the more we're going to fully understand the possibilities going forward. Because um, we are in, in such a, a remarkably similar position as two school districts, um, putting our heads together to, to think it through likely can't lead to something bad. Maybe it doesn't make, maybe it doesn't lead to, to any real change, but at least we've opened the door to it and we've explored the possibility. Um, but it also might lead to something significantly different and that might be great too. So yeah, I'm, I'm a proponent of putting heads together. Krista, did Kevin and I miss anything from the sort of recap of our meeting with Sue from a while back as we talked through the possibility of the various committees coming together? Can you hear me okay? A little bit faint, but okay. How about now? That's better. Okay, um, I don't think so. No, we really didn't get into any specifics yet with Sue. And maybe when we talk more about the community engagement piece, we can talk about how to weave this into that plan, but I think it's still pretty open right now. Mm -hmm. More thoughts? Hi. I, I am, I'm definitely, I'm all for it. Um, I, I look at both districts of um, the, the underutilization of both districts and coming from an environment where plants close and plants get realigned and that sort of thing, um, it, it makes a lot of sense to, to consider it. I think on the high school level, there's a lot of exciting possibilities. Um, on the grade school level, it could get kind of messy, <laughs> quite honestly. But uh, um, but I, I think it's it's worth worth pursuing. Like they say, if you don't ask, you don't know. You know. So I do think one important um, piece of information to make sure everyone has going into this that's a a critical difference and will have an impact and probably complicate things is their district as of July 1st, their board has the authority to close a building. Our board never has that authority unless there's a vote to change the articles of agreement. So that's a big, big difference. May I ask a question? Do, um, you know, Middlebury's already made some statements that make it clear they're going to be closing buildings. Have you heard that Addison Northwest is going to be exercising that option as well in the short term? No, well, in a way, so they've already repurposed one of their buildings, the Addison Central School. So um, in some ways you could argue they've done something similar already. Um, I do think for sure the they're in conversations about how how many schools can they operate just as we are so 
I don't know. My sense is that the the repurposing of Addison Northwest or of, of uh, Addison Central School did not solve their economic challenges that they're going to have to continue to explore further big decisions. Whether that means for sure closing other schools or not, I don't know. I would suspect so because um, Again, there's even with the repurposing of Addison Central School, they're in a similar position that we are with the the underutilization of facilities, which means there's overhead cost. Um, but I I can't recall a specific um, any any specifics in terms of you know what those decisions are going to be for them. Maybe similar to us in that they have a few scenarios they're working through, but no clarity in terms of what decision that's going to lead to just some possibilities to explore. But Patrick, Anna, did you have any um, more thoughts what, about what, what, what Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think there are a few things that seemed clear based on the information that came out of Addison Central. One is that it seems clear they're going to have fewer schools. Um, it's a little less clear how many or which ones, you know, it seemed like Mary Hogan was and uh, was going to stay that that seemed to be true in most of the scenarios which geographically and and from the physical aspects of the building makes sense but but I do think that's that was fairly bold and that it was clear they're going to have fewer buildings um and they're in a position to have that authority to be that bold we this board can't ever be that bold to say for sure we're going to close buildings because the board doesn't have the authority to do that yeah, so and I think that's why I raised it because I think that's a, a critical difference in that both Addison Northwest and Addison Central can at some point make it clear we are going to be closing schools. And people can begin to wrap their head around that and begin to think about what that might look like. Our board uh, likely won't ever be in that position to be able to be that confident moving forward because it takes a vote of a, the electorate to make that happen. But Patrick, you do have the authority to move like where students go to school. Is yep. that right? So you can repurpose right. a building. Right. Yes. Josh, what were you saying earlier? Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, I was just I was just um, wondering if you had any forethought if we were to start going down the same path in a, in a joint venture with Addison Northeast, if there was a way to create a fire stop between there. I, I don't know. I'm just, you know, I, I would I would imagine that folks here in, in um, Bristol and in, in the five town area would hate to have um, what's happening, you know, a school closure be forced upon them because of something happening in Addison Northeast. Do any forethought and how to create a fire, a fire line on that? I mean, it's sort of interesting. Uh, not really. I mean, either if we're clearly staying separate from one another, then I feel yeah. like the separation and the different languages in, in our articles of agreement I think creates that yeah. firewall because we just operate very differently. The other way to go about it is if, if we take it to the other extreme, if we did merge into a single unified school district, that would likely bring about a brand new um, uh, sort of dark document titled the Articles of Agreement, right? So we'd have a new set of these articles that would um, define how we can operate. Um, mm. And maybe that and it would be interesting because I'm sure it would be a hot topic if we were to do that. Would we give the authority to close a building to the town or would we give the authority to close a building to this new board that would likely need to be formed? Hmm. And I'd be curious. I wonder, I wonder how that conversation would go. Go ahead, Krista. Yeah, I'm thinking that collaboration is maybe seen differently than information sharing and also perception is reality. So I think it, it's important for us to consider how we 
I think the shared communication makes a ton of sense because there are a lot of questions that came up in our fall engagement that asked about looking at partnership with Addison Northwest. Um, but I think it will be good to be mindful about how that evolves so that it isn't um, seen as a fate, a complete, like that this is what we're doing. Um, it's got to be part of our process, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. But um, I can't remember how your agenda for today is structured, but I know that when we, we are you know, beginning to build a plan for our engagement work for the fall, and we can just be really mindful about how that gets embedded. And remembering, I mean, to that point, remembering that 98% of the electorate probably has no idea that there were, there were those conversations about partnering with Addison Northwest that came up in the fall, right? Of, we had hundreds of people, but there were many thousands or several thousand that were not present that are going to show up to the polls in making whatever decision end up may, may be getting made down the road. Right, so if folks see, oh, we're collaborating with Addison Northwest, I could just imagine where that goes in, in some people's brains. Oh my gosh, we're closing our school and we're going to have one in Virgins. Whether that's true or not, I think it is going to be a reaction that some people have. Anything else? So we are walking down a path for some initial meetings. And then we'll start dancing from there. So my takeaway from this conversation, and correct me if I'm wrong, is there's interest in this facilities group in meeting with the Addison Northwest facilities group. And I can try to collaborate with their superintendent to find a date that works. Does that seem, am I, yeah. am I picking up what you're laying down here? Yes. Okay. Do we want to clarify what we want to do in our brief introductory meeting? Probably. <laughs> I think Kevin and I would appreciate that, holding some responsibility for helping build the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> um any kind so i like how krista put it with the information sharing and i think just some kind of way to i don't know learn learn how we are and maybe the the, the back story of where we've been in the past even year just something simple like some kind of way to share share out what has been chat where have we had some successes and where have we been challenged and we want to make sure we don't make those mistakes um, yeah i think patrick has set a really um, well documented processes first um, reaching out to the community then evaluating the facilities and the population and then eventually return to the community with um, some feasible options. And I think um, taking that process and looking at their process, this is probably a good first step. I think uh, evaluating our threats as well is kind of like, this is where uh, other communities have uh, experienced issues and these types of consolidations and, and this consolidation of uh, a landmine in itself, that word. Um, so that's what, that's what my thoughts on that. You want to have the, I'm assuming. Go ahead. I just was curious if you wanted to do if if the community engagement committees from each group were meeting also at the same time, if it was better, if there was just like one brief or one, do you, would you rather do them all at the same time? But I don't know if they're meeting with Addison Northwest also. So we, we do have a meeting of the chairs. So Kevin, Krista, Don, and myself meeting with the same sort of uh, representation from Madison Northwest later in July, um, talking about that bigger picture um, 
bringing everyone together or not and, and how that works. So maybe looking at um, whatever might happen. It sounds like there's interest and support from this subcommittee in having those relationships with Addis Northwest. But maybe before we actually establish a date and firm up any agenda, we'll wait for that meeting to happen and see where that meeting takes us. Okay, I mean, you might achieve the purpose just with that meeting. So um, it might be, this is like, oh, what are you guys gonna do now once we get our studies back um, type of thing that that would be useful and to have a little bit of, but if you're already starting that relationship building, then I think it's probably wise to wait. I think Sarah, you 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 uh, had some wisdom that this is going to be a kickoff meeting, so we can like check and see, make sure everybody's got fingers and toes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, it, probably talking and again, we're talking about backstories and information sharing. We we have um, our charge wraps up a lot of what what we need to be considering, and that's a great document to be sharing as well. So if there's, is there any other discussions or anybody have any further comments about potential collaboration with Northwest? Nope. So our next agenda item is a little bit of discussion or advisement discussion, I guess you could say the Community Engagement Committee has been working on um, I don't want to call it a project, but um, an initiative, that's the word, initiative, to engage the community with the school and look at some of the challenges that um, we all share, if you will, um, being, you know, uh, stagnant populations, um, housing issues, um, business or lack thereof, or how to attract business, and it all sort of distills into um, you know, a, a healthy population that could potentially positively impact the school system. Um, and they've worked on a list of people to get together that would be um, from various aspects of the community that would be um, different areas of expertise, if you will, um, to try to um, align themselves with a, a round table, a task force. Um, Krista and her group have sent out, or sending out letters, if they haven't, um, for a meeting towards the end of July. And <clears throat> I think, and since we have Krista here, I don't know if you mind talking a little bit more and filling in the gaps of uh, my short overview. Sure. So um, out of the fall engagement work, there were questions that arose that go beyond the scope of um, facilities consultant work or board work, but that there was a lot of energy in the community around exploring. And um, while we were in this pause of waiting on the report from the NESDEC group, um, and beginning to do any engagement with the community around that information, we decided to revisit that those questions and see whether we could bring together other people in the community to share those ideas that bubbled up and then the particular challenges of the school district currently. And at our last meeting, Patrick brought up the point, which I don't think I had really registered, but is true that in the fall engagement work, a lot of the folks were thinking of reaching out to for this roundtable discussion, they were not necessarily present or engaged. And so they might not even have a, cl a clear or current sense of the realities of our situation. Um, but the idea would be just to, to find points of intersection and see if there's any interest in community leaders in looking at long-term, um, well, increasing communication and collaboration just in general, but then also are any of these ideas, uh, advocacy in the legislature, finding ways to draw more people to the five towns, 
um, public private partnerships, do any of them have, uh, is anybody interested in pursuing them more deeply and forming a kind of a task force or maybe several working groups? So we're, we see this as our chance to kind of convene and instigate a group of people, but then see where it goes and step back and let it bubble up and however it's going to bubble up. Um, but recognizing that that it's a way for us to go back to those questions that are kind of hard for just the school board to really answer, but that are probably going to come up again as we move forward on any one of these scenarios. And so it seems really important to take some kind of action on, on looking at them with a bigger group of people. So we've scheduled the date for July 29th. We're actually hoping to do it in person, either outside or in a big space. We're envisioning maybe 30 people um, initially. And um, we've got a list of you know, every town select board members, zoning administrators, real estate agents, folks who know about housing, childcare providers. And the idea is that, you know, we don't necessarily need, for example, every Bristol select board member there, but maybe we ask the chair if they'd like to appoint someone to attend um, as a representative of their group. Um, so we're finalizing the list and hoping to mostly do personal invitations, but we have a letter that kind of frames the work. Um, and and you know let you know get that done probably by this week um, and in the meantime sue and i or sue is helping to create an agenda that we're going to work on together and share with patrick and don and kevin this thursday um, and then bring back to the community engagement group on our call next tuesday thank you does anybody have any uh, impressions That's great. Good, good, good. See a lot of mute buttons on here. Uh, open question to the group, and I apologize for not knowing better. Um, how is the state reacting to COVID-19 in terms of the um, the, the pupil count and um, the potential that a lot of these, a lot of our schools are going to be seeing similar issues with enrollment in um, 2020 and possibly on? Is that is there any groups that are engaged at that level or? Is it, is it being deferred all to the superintendents? I think that's a that's a big question. Um, there there isn't clarity on that right now, um, and some of that is you know who knows really what the enrollment impact of COVID nineteen is going to be. Um, yeah. Do you know? I, I'm sure the folks at the state level who who basically generate the equalized pupil counts. Um, will take that into effect. I mean, it's going to have an impact statewide on really what it'll have an impact on probably is the spending threshold per pupil. Um, and because the equalized pupil count is determined um, in part based on the total number of students enrolled in the state, um, it, it's just by that nature of how the formula works, it's going to have an impact statewide. I think where where there may be potential for winners and losers is, you know, if, if everybody experiences a similar drop in enrollment as a result of COVID-19, then probably that all comes in, comes out in the wash in terms of the economic impact and, and, and what the um, spending threshold might be. It's unlikely that it's going to be pretty uniform across the state. So yeah, the places that lose more kids, are going to see a more negative impact and the places that lose fewer kids might see less of an impact. And that's all just my speculation, just from my understanding of how the system works. When we have more real information and the folks at the state are actually looking at real numbers, they are the ones that are going to have to sort of reconcile the, the impact of COVID and what that means for school districts. Because on top of all of that, we have to reconcile this expense out of the ed fund as well 
Um, so there, there's a great deal of uh, financial uncertainty um, as a result of COVID, all being on top of the, the financial uncertainty we had prior to COVID. Yeah, and Chris, I apologize. I, I did derail your, your, um, your thing a little bit. So um, I know I do remember we discussed that a little bit in kind of the global aspect of uh, child care uh, uh, or the funding of schools. So um, is it inappropriate to ask for a line item in our agenda just to touch on this from a, a state level, even if there's no news? Um, so we can at least mention it because it may inform our conversation on a week to week or our monthly basis. So can you clarify, Josh, what uh, agenda you want a line item on? Would it... Just a line item just to see if there's anything from the state that updates um, how they're evaluating people counts. So it'd be um, for this? And yeah, I, I, I don't know if it's, I, I don't know if it's beyond what we're looking at as a group. So I'm sorry, it would be if you're talking about this subcommittee, not another group. Correct. Correct. And, and, Feel free to tell me that that's kind of beyond our mandate. I feel like it's related for sure. You know, it has an impact on on our affordability and numbers of students, et cetera. I, I think timing becomes the tricky part. I'm, I'm not sure we'll see. We often don't get equalized pupil information until mid December, sometimes much later than that. Um, okay. So it would, it would be a while before I would expect to see anything concrete coming out of the state in terms of how they're going to reconcile the impact COVID-19 has on enrollment. We may see some things sooner in terms of um, replenishing the Ed Fund, but probably not on equalized pupil. Boyd? I, I certainly can reach out to our contacts through the state that drive the equalized pupil just to see to get a flavor of, of what they're thinking. Are they starting to form some sort of an opinion on it? And, and I could report anything from that back, knowing that um, in all likelihood between now and December, anything we get for info in the short term is probably um, partial at best. But it would be, it would be not a difficult ask for me. Krista? Um, your, Josh's question just makes me think about the importance of people understanding how much information we'll actually have before we have to make decisions. And within yep. that information we know, are there, how much flexibility is there? <laughs> <laughs> or lever points for change. And I'm just saying this because this is something that is, you know, we grapple with at the board level all the time, you know, we kind of know, but we don't know, but yet we still have a budget we have to pass. And we kind of know, and we don't know, but we have to still figure out what to do with our schools and, and in the community as well. So I think it is, a, it, it kind of speaks to like a bigger question that I think a lot of people have and will continue to have. And just the more education we can do you know, what are the facts right now? What do we still not know? And what are, what are the things we have to decide right now? And I think having oh, enough- Right, and, and to, Sorry, a, ahead, to a Josh. degree, um, and I think this was mentioned earlier, um, it may not change, it likely does not change the trajectory of the conversation. And that, that was more or less my, well, the point I was gonna make too, like there are, we could very easily get lost in all of the details um, around the numbers and enrollment and, and all of that. Um, for me, what, what has been clear and is even more clear with COVID um, is we aren't going to be able to afford to keep all of our schools open at, at the staffing levels they currently have and the programming levels we currently have. Those are, those are sort of the three legs, right? We have school buildings, we have staffing, and we have programming, um, and we have our tax rates. Something's gonna have to give. Either taxes are gonna have to go way up to keep the programming and staffing and buildings open, or programming's gonna have to go down to keep taxes uh, relatively flat and keep buildings open, or buildings are gonna have to go to keep taxes flat and keep staffing where they are. Like it's something 
what hasn't changed and is even more clear is that something's going to have to give in the end and, and we have to try to make an informed decision as a community about what's the something or is there some pot of gold out there that is a public private partnership or something else that generates the revenue that can keep all of those three things afloat for us as we've come to know them. And I feel like if we can keep that conversation out there that we, we have to figure out how we manage this rather than um, rather than get lost in the details of was it is the threshold $1,897 a student or did it go up to $19,024 a student like that detail almost mm -hmm. matter it's the concept of how do we manage this this economic crisis that that we're in. Well, Josh, I don't know if you, how set you are with this, but I, I tend to agree that um, it's just one aspect and um, we're dealing with some pretty high level planning right now um, that this particular aspect is just one of many of the, the whole funding equation that needs to be sorted out as we come down from our 30,000 foot view down to 20,000 foot or whatever this committee ends up at, which won't be 10 feet off the ground more than likely. No, I, I agree. I just, I, I guess what um, I was imagining is maybe this year becomes a wash in terms of some of those benchmarks uh, from the state level and they get some reprieve, uh, recognizing that things are going completely askew. But um, again, it doesn't change the traje trajectory of the conversation. So I, I agree with you, Kevin and, and Patrick, that's fine. Yeah, for, so for our realities, some school districts, the, their primary economic impact that they're paying attention to is anything that comes about from COVID specifically. If all of the economic hardships of COVID were washed away somehow by some mechanism at the state, whether it's the equalized pupil count or it's the amount we can spend for equalized pupil, that pretty much only resets us back to the economic hardship we were anticipating before COVID, <laughs> which we still have to, right. you know, wrestle with and, and figure out what to do. So I think we're, we're not unique by any means, um, but not all districts are looking at uh, at the declining enrollment that we are with or without um, the hardships from COVID-19. Many are, but not all. So do we have any other comments or questions about the um, efforts of the communication uh, group and their uh, school community uh, engagement efforts? Can we go on? Are we closing that item? So I think the next thing is um, to just go around the table, if you will, the virtual table, and uh, get on the soapbox for a minute and 40 seconds. If you've got any um, burning issues that we didn't cover um, today and want to talk about or um, consider. So Josh, you want to kick it off? No, I, I, I'm really happy with the discussion we had today. I thought it was pretty useful and thank you for your patience with um, you guys swim in these waters all the time so you, you know what it's like, what these conversations are like. So um, I think that we're, again, I'm really positive and I, and I um, appreciate all the efforts that are going on especially the tangential part, maybe we're tangential, the communication um, uh, committee um, who's, um, I sat on one of their meetings and it was pretty cool. So uh, that's all I have to say for today. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, thanks Krista for coming. And also, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the the August 1st rough draft. I think that's a good thing for us because we might, that actually gives us a little bit of time to get, uh, maybe provide a little more information if we think it something's missing before we are really hit with the time crunch. So I like 
I like the August 1st. Thank you. Floyd? No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I think we covered a lot of ground and um, you know, we got a little bit of work and maybe some wood to chop out in front of us. But I don't, I don't, I don't see anything to add to that pile. Thank you. Christine, Katrina? I'm good also. It's just nice to see everybody and that we're bringing us to the forefront every time, which is good because it's easy to get buried in a lot of other thinking and planning. So as soon as we hang up, we'll get back to that. But I'll see you next time. Thank you. Patrick? Uh, again, I think we covered a lot of the ground. I think, you know, Josh, I think your point of, about the, the depth of knowledge that you're seeking and you're picking up really quickly, you're, you're not unique either. I think you represent the majority of our electorate and we need to figure out how do we help get more folks um, involved and, and maybe not necessarily have an expectation to bring them up to your level of understanding as it is now, but certainly to heighten the understanding of a greater portion of our electorate so they can go to the polls whenever for whatever in a really informed way. But this is also really, it's really emotionally charged stuff, which can be a barrier on top of all the normal barriers to getting people to be really informed and open to possibilities. Um, and there are a lot of details we can get lost in um, that can be challenging too. So dialing in the right level of, of information, um, but not even, you know, not even disseminating information with sort of the light engagement, but really thinking about thick engagement as well and, and giving people more and more opportunities to wrestle deeply with the complexities, um, which I think we, we achieved really well thanks to Krista and her team in the fall. And we need to continue that as we get more bits of information to take us even deeper uh, into those conversations. I think we need to wrestle with it as a community, um, probably more so than our, other, than our neighboring communities do because our community makes the decision versus a school board that will have a greater depth of understanding in the other communities. We need to try to bring the, the majority of our electorate up to the level of understanding that a school board might, which is a daunting task. Uh, but I feel like that's that's sort of what's laid out before us. Thank you, Patrick. Um, at this point, um, I have nothing to add. At this point, I guess we can open it up for public comment. I don't know if we've had anybody join us. Um, I think it's still Krista and Sally. Okay. Any public comment? No. Okay, um, Sally. Could I just add one thing? Um, well, thanks for letting me join your group. And I really appreciate the cross pollination between this group and Kevin attending our community engagement. Um, one thing I didn't get to say when I was sharing that Sue's developing the agenda for the community roundtable is that um, we're also working on a timeline for community engagement work around this facilities plan and our budget, which we which are really interconnected. And so I hope to be able to be sharing that also on Thursday with Patrick, Kevin and Don. And then that will come back to the full board and to this group to think about and digest. So it is really imperative that we that we think about that. Um, our committee had some good initial conversations at our last meeting. So we have some stuff to, to build on um, and we'll be excited to share that back with you guys. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I'm really glad to hear what's going on in the facilities group. Um, it's a lot of, lot of um, yeah, just a lot of stuff to wrestle with and I appreciate being able to listen in. And, um, and also when I was talking about the forum ideas from 2018, that's with newer things added to them. So I didn't really fully describe them, but it doesn't really matter right now. You know, I just uh, wanted to keep that open because there's, there are a lot of ideas that could help fund things that haven't been talked about before that I think would be worth talking about at some point. Um, anyway, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at this point, I guess I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn. This is Josh. Second, Sarah. Anybody want to talk about it? <laughs> Everybody? <laughs> Everybody in favor, say aye.
Aye. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And thank you, Krista and Sally, for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye. When's our next meeting? August 3rd. So right after the report. Yeah, so that should be a big topic then. Okay, good. So I would. I just want to actually clarify we were going to do that before the retreat. Yeah, we'll have one more meeting before the retreat. Okay, cool. Hopefully Thank it's you. sandwiched between a report and a retreat. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Take care, everybody. Yep. Bye now.